is uh, hard power, the new politics of national security, uh, which is also the title of Dr. O'Hanlon's uh, recently published co-authored work. Uh, the, uh, when, when I spoke with Dr. O'Hanlon originally, I had been primarily interested in his articulation of the great issues in national security, which face the nation and will for a considerable period of time. He also has, as a major theme of the book, a view of how the political parties uh, address the questions of national security, and especially the pressure upon the Democratic Party, if it's going to be truly a dominant party, uh, to have a position on national security which is appropriately sound and fully understands the implications of hard power as well as soft power. And I don't have to tell anyone that this morning's headlines are dealing precisely with the questions of, of how that particular political party will be addressing uh, the national security uh, questions of the day. And the, the theme, the concern of Dr. O'Hanlon, which becomes so clear to not only identify what's important to the nation in foreign policy, but also to wage and carry on uh, a careful and intelligent debate, uh, not overwhelmed by bipartisan politics, which of course happily coincides with the mission of councils like ours, and that's serious discussion of the issues of, of national affairs, foreign policy in, in particular. Now, our guest is known to most of you. You've seen him on television. Um, he's, uh, his credentials are impeccable, not just because he's a Princeton graduate. His, his uh, BA, and, or his BS degree, actually, and uh, master's degree are both in the physical sciences. His PhD in, in uh, public and international affairs, all from Princeton. Uh, he does, did have six or seven years in the government. Um, largely in the office, of the Congressional Budget Office, after having been in the Peace Corps in Africa, and joined Brookings in 1994. And his career there is most impressive. Uh, he's published or co he's authored or co-authored uh, a book a year, from what I can see, on all the facets of, of national security, but also on the Middle East, on homeland security, uh, certainly on Asian, Asian affairs, with an emphasis on North Korea at times, but great strength with respect to China and its relations with Taiwan. Um, the, the articles which he's published, which are numerous, nearly every one of which is, is extraordinarily interesting, have appeared in the, the country's most respected journals. And then as a result of that, that marvelous uh, bit of uh, scholarship, and uh, uh, he then is honored, so to speak, as being a guest on the innumerable talk shows and public affairs programs that are best known around the nation. Uh, many of our council members have remarked to me about how much they appreciate his writings. This is the third time he's addressed us. He's spoken on North Korea, he spoke, given an update on Iraq, and tonight uh, what I think is an extraordinarily interesting and uh, very, very timely uh, set of considerations about uh, the public discussion and the great issues of the day. It's an enormous pleasure to present once again Dr. Michael O'Hanlon. Thank you very much, Frank. Extremely generous uh, welcome. And this is just a great place to speak about foreign affairs. The Baltimore Council, I think, or anybody who's had a chance to speak here is just one of the great institutions in the country. Uh, I've spoken to a few other uh, vigorous and vibrant uh, local foreign affairs chapters, and usually you get 30 or 40 people. And Baltimore is something else with the kind of energy that is always felt in the crowd and the size of the crowd and the interest in the issues and the expertise. So I look forward to the conversation uh, and the discussion afterwards. I also want to thank my in-laws, Joan and Griff, for being here, and all of you, again, for the, for the, for the welcome. Uh, Last week, I got to give a talk in Dallas on Friday, which was five days after the Redskins beat the Cowboys, or I guess you could say after the Cowboys gave the game to the Redskins. For those of you who watched that, I, I don't want to be too pejorative, but you could say a similar uh, fate just uh, uh, arrived with Baltimore's uh, Ravens this past game. And, um, and I think there's a commonality here 
between the Redskins, the Cowboys, excuse me, the Redskins, the Ravens, and the Democrats. They all won pretty ugly. And, 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 and they won for reasons that are not going to get them to the place they really want to be unless they start coming up with a better agenda. Now, this is not really meant as a critique. It is certainly a critique of the Ravens and the Redskins. And the Redskins have since proven how bad they really are as a football team. Uh, it's not really meant as a critique, per se, of the Democratic strategy in the sense that I think political operatives will tell you when you have an unpopular incumbent, a midterm election is a referendum on that incumbent. And obviously, when you have a war that the country is frustrated by uh, and troubled by, it makes sense to hone in on the issue of accountability. So at one narrow level, there is a political logic to the basic campaign the Democratic Party just ran successfully. And I say this, by the way, as sort of a hawkish or a hard-powered Democrat myself. Kurt and I, Kurt Campbell and I, my co-author, wrote this book from the point of view of two Democrats who are loyal Democrats and yet also often frustrated by our party's positions on national security and also very much believers in the two-party debate. And when we say that, it's not just because we're centrist per se. It's not because we always think that the best answer is in the middle. A lot of issues, I think shaking it up is the good, is the good approach. And that's why, Frank, I appreciate your words about how uh, the Baltimore Council is about debate and discussion. It's not just about you know, doing a straw poll and figuring out what the average position is and suggesting that to the country. So this book is written not with the perspective of finding some elusive center that is there if we only are reasonable enough to grab it, but it's written more with the point of view of here are eight or ten big issues of the day. And you know what? Sometimes we think Democrats are right, sometimes Republicans are right. I'm sure some of the time we're ourselves flat wrong, but we're going to try to analyze this in a spirit that we think is needed for the Democratic Party. And we begin with the motivation that the Democratic Party has been underachieving on foreign policy and especially national security for about four decades. And, and the conclusion, uh, for one thing, we, we don't begin with our own opinion, we begin with public opinion polls. And at the end of the day, to some extent, Politicians have to consider public opinion polls a meaningful measure of their success because you need to get elected to be an effective politician. And ever since Vietnam, Democrats have been 30 to 40 percentage points behind Republicans on the national security issue. And we, we don't come up with this information ourselves, but we certainly uh, summarize it in the book. And that's one motivating factoid for any Democrat. There are a few more that we put in as well to try to motivate people. And let me share just a couple of these factoids with you. Because I think they are, in one sense, obvious, and in another sense, often forgotten by party strategists. Uh, another factoid is there are about 27 million Americans alive today who have worn the country's uniform. That's a staggeringly big number. At least it was to me when I first calculated it. And it, it's not that hard to calculate. You just get lists of how many people have, have, have served in this country's military and then uh, other data on who's still alive, and you can come up with the number. But you know what that means? 27 million plus, let's say, plus or minus 15 million spouses uh, or, or so surviving. 40 million voting age Americans have either been in the military or are directly related by marriage to somebody in the military. That tells me national security is always an important issue for those people. It doesn't mean they're all hawks. It doesn't mean they're all going to vote you know, John McCain just because he was a vet. It doesn't mean they're all going to vote John Kerry because he was a vet. But it does mean that for them, national security is always a big issue. And I frankly think Democratic strategists forget this. And, and point number one would be in 2000, and this is admittedly in the pre-9-11 world, so you may say I'm wasting your time with another era, uh, and we've obviously moved beyond it. But just one quick factoid, in the pre-9-11 world, Al Gore was told, don't talk about defense. Despite the fact that you're an incumbent vice president, despite the fact that you were on the Senate Armed Services Committee, that you had some honorable service in Vietnam, even if it was short and not of a combat nature, but it was still an honorable service, despite the fact that you have an impressive track record in dealing with some national security issues, especially as the Clinton administration got its sea legs on defense in the last four or five years. Despite all that, don't talk about it, because the voters don't want to hear about it. And Unfortunately for Mr. Gore, he listened to this advice. And he conceded the issue to a person who, whatever his qualities and whatever his strengths, was a governor of Texas. And previously to that, he had had no national political experience, or no uh, major political experience of any kind. And all George W. had to do then was to wrap one arm around Dick Cheney and one arm around Colin Powell, and the issue is his. How could you do this? As a political strategist, how could you as a Democrat offer up this red carpet to George W. Bush. Um, that's, and by the way, there's an additional, in addition to the, the 27 million 
uh, who have worn the nation's uniform and all of their spouses, not to mention their kids. Um, there's a broader point here, before I give you two more factoids. Uh, there's a broader point, which is that I don't know about you, and I don't have a lot of elaborate political science to back this up, but when I listen to candidates discuss national security, I feel like I'm getting a better gauge of what they're like as people than if I hear them discuss tax policy or health care policy or something more arcane and harder to digest. National security has a certain sort of you know, gravity to it and a certain, at the end of the day, a certain simplicity. Probably why I chose it as a field. It, it works well with my limited abilities. But basically, at the end of the day, uses of force, yes or no. Or how you're going to uh, prosecute this war. Now, yeah, there's a lot of complexity. And we've seen in the Iraq experience that actually yes or no was not a good enough answer. How you did it was every bit as important as whether you did it. But nonetheless, when voters hear people talk about defense issues, I think they feel they can judge to some extent what that person is like as a, as a character, as, a, as an individual, what their personality, what their character, what their values are like. And therefore, in a way, defense counts double. It counts on its own terms, and it counts for the way in which voters get a prism into the political persona of the person they're thinking of voting for. To me, this is an obvious point, and yet it doesn't seem to occur to many Democratic strategists, or at least those before last Tuesday. We'll get to Tuesday in a second. Um, so that's one point. An another factoid, and I think most of you remember this from 2004, in the presidential race, that by most metrics, I think it's fair to say, with all due respect to George W. Bush, that John Kerry really should have won in the sense that we were eight months into a war that was, or we were a year and a half into a war that for eight months had been going worse every month than the month before, with all the things that happened in 04, the Fallujah firefights, Abu Ghraib, uh, excessive casualties, no real improvement in the security situation, growing insurgency. Um, but in that, in that election, 86% of the voters who put the war on terror topped their list of issues chose George W. Bush. Now, the Iraq issue was more of a draw. But 86% who voted war on terror issues voted for the Republican. Um, that should tell you something about, deep down, who voters had a comfort level with, the Republican or the Democrat. Obviously, it has to do with the individuals involved as well, but it's still a very telling factoid. Third factoid, and then I'll be done with these sorts of little um, mathematical uh, you know, distractions for a minute. Um, in the officer corps of the US military, there's about a 5 to 1 ratio Republican to Democrat. Now, I have, and I'm sure you do too, ultimate respect for the officers uh, of our military and for the, all the men and women of our military. I don't hold it against them, they're Republicans. I don't hold it against any of you who may be that you're Republicans, I'm, I'm teasing. But uh, the point is, is it healthy for our democracy uh, when we're supposed to have a depoliticized military that by a ratio of five to one, they vote Republican? And frankly, admit, you know, declare themselves Republican by a very high ratio too. I'm not suggesting any kind of insubordination is going to occur. But I am suggesting that, you know, there are people in the Clinton era who worried that the democratic relationship with the military was not quite as competent and not quite as balanced as it could have been. Now, Rumsfeld went too far in the other direction, and I'll come to him in a second, too. But nonetheless, this is of some concern, and it should be of concern to every Democrat. For such an, a respected institution in our country as the armed forces, to be in a position where by a five-to-one ratio, the officers prefer the other side. Even if you think they got it wrong, and somehow in their assessment, and it's groupthink that's perpetuating it, which is not what I'm suggesting, but even if you believe that, you have to be troubled by this reality. So the Democrats have a big problem on defense, and I feel this way despite last Tuesday. So let me say a couple words about that, and then I want to talk in specific about three issues to talk about what we mean by a hard power Democrat. Um, because there's no one theme. It's not, a simple, it's not a simple overall story that I can tell you about what Kurt and I claim to be a hard power Democrat. Uh, so I'm going to have to do it a little bit by way of example. But first, uh, last Tuesday, just to state the obvious, but to have it on the table, Democrats won because the war in Iraq is going badly and we aren't winning. And as Fareed Zakaria, the respected Newsweek columnist, put it on the cover of his magazine uh, last week, we're losing, but all is not necessarily yet lost. And that's my opinion. I'm going to come to that later on. But we are losing, or we're certainly not winning, and things are going in the wrong direction. That's what I mean by losing. And the, and the trajectory we're on is probably headed towards a bad outcome, unless things get radically changed. And I think that's just the facts. And I'll be happy to uh, accept any challenges to that later on, but I think those are the beginnings of wisdom with Iraq policy. We are not winning right now, and we're probably losing. So that's why Democrats won Tuesday because um, they could run on a platform of change 
without having to say what that meant. They were not running directly against George Bush. George Bush was one very concrete, specific figure with a very specific policy, and a war we're losing right now, at least. And the Democrats were an amalgamation, uh, like any opposition party would be, and especially in an off year, where, you know, take your pick. Do you want to personify the Democrats as Nancy Pelosi or Howard Dean or my preference, more like a Steny Hoyer uh, or a, a Hillary Clinton or a John Edwards? Take your pick. You can have your pick because there is no standard bearer for the party. So George Bush, in this case, in 2004, he could beat John Kerry. And what his operatives were able to do to John Kerry's image, uh, I'm not suggesting they were hitting any, or at least not much lower below the belt than Kerry's people were, but in any event, uh, it was Bush against Kerry, or Bush's image against Kerry's image. This time, it's Bush against the facts of a losing war. And in that situation, any incumbent has a hard time doing well in an off year, and Bush particularly was not well positioned. So what does this mean for Democrats? They have not won any mandate. And this, this I, I don't know if there are political scientists in the room who may want to jump in later, but historically speaking, when I think to other midterm elections, there's usually at least a little bit of a mandate that the winning side can claim. In this case, there's not a whole lot except change. So I think we're going to have to come back to this and start to ask, what does it mean now to change Iraq policy, and what are the plausible ways we can think about doing so? But before I get to that, I want to talk about two other issues in hard power or a national security that Kurt and I go through in the book, just to give you, again, a flavor for what we're trying to do. Because let me start by saying what we're not going to try to do in this book, what we're not pr pr proposing or presenting. We're not suggesting that uh, Democrats or independents or progressives or whatever term you want to use to be the opposite of neocons and conservatives. We're not suggesting they have a big new worldview that says it's all about globalization, it's all about the new security threats, it's all about HIV AIDS and ozone depletion and, and global warming. We're not suggesting that. In fact, we're arguing somewhat against it on the grounds that we say if you are asking this country for the right to lead it, you've got to start the old-fashioned question of can you protect us against our near and near-term real concrete enemies. The American people expect an answer to that. Republicans get it, they keep it simple, and it's correct to keep it simple because you need some answer about what you're gonna do against Al-Qaeda. And uh, the other agenda is important, but you don't start with the other agenda. Unless, of course, you're absolutely convinced that you've got a big new global worldview that really can explain everything, including Al-Qaeda, including Saddam Hussein, Kim Jong-il, President Ahmadinejad, and every other problem we face in terms of that broad worldview. If you can come up with it, go ahead. Uh, lay it out there. But usually when Democrats start trying to come up with an alternative worldview, they overreach. And they sound like they're getting a little mushy. And that they're focused on the new issues at the expense of dealing first with the old issues. And so we say, be careful. Don't be too smart. At least don't be too smart unless you're a lot smarter than we are right in the book. Because we could not find that big theme. So what we found was, obviously you got to work with allies. Some of the things Democrats tend to say are true. You got to try to work with allies. You got to avoid the unilateralism of George Bush. But multilateralism is a, me is a means. It's a method. It's not an end. It doesn't tell you what kind of world you're trying to build. Democracy promotion makes sense. Democrats hate to admit it these days because George Bush is the last president to give a big speech on it. Um, but Democrats have been in favor of democracy promotion going back to another uh, Princetonian, Woodrow Wilson. And, um, and certainly it's a bipartisan tradition in our foreign policy. So there are a lot of values that we should still promote and that we should be proud of. But this does not really add up to a new alternative worldview that guides your future action. And what we say in the book is, you know what? Think hard about six or eight big issues of the day. There are six or eight preeminent national security issues. The rise of China, the future of our energy policy, dealing with the, the so-called rogue states or the axis of evil. And each one of these is a big problem. Um, the way in which we deal with the long war on terror the next generation of would-be terrorists, how we prevent them from being formed in the first place, and obviously how we handle Iraq. This is basically our short list of issues, and then presenting uh, a viable homeland security strategy and managing the Department of Defense. That's pretty much our agenda. And we try to say, within each one, let's be pragmatic. Uh, sure, if you have a big ideology that's an alternative, compelling theme, great. But we don't have that so much as we want to have a few useful guideposts for each question. And let's have a debate in the party and in the country about appropriate policy. That may not win you a lot of uh, Pulitzer Prizes. It certainly won't win us one. And it may not win any candidate a great prize for great speeches in the history of American foreign policy if they give a speech that's just pragmatic on six or eight big questions. But 
uh, the analogy we would have going back to football is, you know, sometimes it's better to go with the ground game and establish the five-yard plays and the eight-yard plays instead of just throwing the bomb. Try to get solid on these eight or ten big issues. And let the voters see that you're solid and that you're constantly thinking about these questions the way a Sam Nunn used to, the way Bill Perry did, the way a lot of hard power Democrats that we admire have in their career. Okay, and also don't be afraid to admit that some things about the Bush administration may actually uh, be worthwhile. There may actually be some useful lessons, just as there are of any American administration in the past. And so we try to go through that in a way trying to, you know, uh, par partially, gently and friend friendly uh, provoke our fellow Democrats with things they don't like to hear, like Rumsfeld did some good things, or the Patriot Act is excellent legislation, or a couple other things that we think the Bush administration got right. Um, so let me now that I hopefully have grabbed your interest for a second on that, uh, mention a couple more words on Homeland Security, a couple more words uh, on Rumsfeld, and then get to Iraq, which is going to be the main thing I want to focus on, because I know it's on all of our minds. Um, on Homeland Security, if you listen to a lot of the rhetoric of the last two years, Democrats have been concerned about encroachments on civil liberties. And uh, they have tended to emphasize also that we got to inspect containers coming into the United States in cities like Baltimore, uh, that we obviously have to integrate terror watch lists, but they've also been just as apt to say, watch out about the encroachment on civil liberties. Uh, Bush has gone too far. A lot of the surveillance methods are inappropriate. We've really got to have the rule of law. This is an executive out of control. Be careful. Well, I sympathize with some of those specific Democratic points, but the bottom line is, in our view, in this book at least, on substance, the Bush administration's homeland security strategy is basically right. And what I mean by that is they focus on prevention and intelligence and stopping attacks before they happen. Now, logically speaking, there are different ways you can try to prevent attacks. You can have armed guards around any building of this size. You can try to have every police force in the country prepare to deal with a chemical attack in case one happens in the city in question. You can put a lot of resources into site defense and into consequence management. And we should put some resources. And there are some areas we need to do more, but you know what? That's not the way to win the battle. You don't want to wait until the attack is in the final stages of preparation or until it's already occurred before you invest your dollars. And you, know, you don't want to direct your effort to that tier of the, of the problem. You want to try to stop the people in the first place. There are a lot of clever ways to try to figure this out. My former colleague Richard Falkenrath, who worked for Tom Ridge in the Bush administration, he's now the Deputy Police Commissioner for Counterterrorism in New York at NYPD. He pointed out that some of these, um, some of these things the Bush administration wants to do with passenger flight lists that get us into problems with our European friends make very good sense if you just think about what we're trying to do. Let's say, uh, let's say I'm a person who has a lot of terrorist friends, but no terrorist past myself. I'm not on a watch list. But I have had a lot of phone calls with people in Pakistan. And then I wind up having a lot of phone calls with a certain cell of individuals in Manhattan. And let's say that they can find 10 other people like me who have that same line of conversation. And ultimately, it winds up with that same cell in Manhattan. Well, you'd want to be able to trace some of these calls even if it means tracing my calls individually, in order to see where they wind up. This is the basic logic that Falkenrath explains, because you have no way of knowing about that. If that cell in Manhattan is also people who are first-time terrorists, you don't have any other way of knowing who they are except by who they talk to. So you've got to be able to do chains of communication, unless they are foolish enough or sloppy enough to talk themselves directly to Pakistan out of their phone in Manhattan. The way you're going to figure out who they are uh, is by going through this circuitous route of figuring out who else were, is talking to each other. Now, yes, there have to be safeguards, and Democrats should engage very vigorously in the debate about safeguards. And yes, I do think the Bush administration has not been scrupulous enough about civil liberties. And yes, I think the Bush administration has deliberately gone too far in order to sucker punch Democrats into counter-reacting on some of these points so we look weak on defense and national security. I believe all those things to be true, but I still think, logically speaking, you've got to focus on prevention, intelligence, surveillance. That's the only way in which you can systematically stop this problem before it's too late. So we have a number of things in our book about how you do this. The next logical steps, one of them would be that most police forces in the country, in their own small way at least, should model uh, certain units after what New York has done with Rich Falkenrath's operation, uh, an operation that Michael Sheehan, who's a former Clinton administration official, had first um, carried out after 9-11. And you should create dedicated teams on your police force. 
of who are responsible for counterterrorism. Now, admittedly, not every city can put 500 people on the job the way New York has done. In fact, no other city can put 500 people on the job. But there's a benefit to giving the FBI some help. There's a benefit to having your police forces thinking about counterterrorism, because they're the ones that know that neighborhoods and walk the, and walk the beats and know who's renting trucks carrying toxic materials and know who is in places that don't really seem to belong. And you can put together information and construct some kind of an intelligence picture of what might be going on before an attack. That's just one example. I don't mean to say it's a panacea, but it's the next logical step in Homeland Security. Again, this book has a lot of, I hope, medium big ideas. It doesn't have a lot of home runs. We don't have huge sweeping new thrusts in policy because we're interested in the five and eight yard gains. We think that's the way in which you build up seriousness and credibility on national security on most issues. Uh, let me talk about Rumsfeld for a second and then Iraq. Um, Rumsfeld's an intriguing figure and I'm sure other people in this room find him fascinating. I'm sure a lot of you find him maddening. I'm sure some of you find him uh, sympathetic, or those of you who may have supported him and now uh, regret that he's been pushed out. Um, whatever you think, I, I don't think he's boring. And I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I think all of us who, who are interested in management of the military uh, can learn something by thinking through what he got right and what he got wrong. One more motivation for our book, uh, Kurt served in the Clinton administration in the Pentagon. And I, he was very proud to do that. He had a great service uh, dealing with issues with Korea, Taiwan, and Japan in particular. But he, from inside, and myself from outside, also noticed a dynamic where this, whether it was because of the five to one political ratio, Republican, Democrat, uh, in the officer corps, whether it was because of Bill Clinton's own personal issues, whatever, Democrats had a little bit of a hard time in certain situations challenging the military. And I'll give you an example. And you can get this out of the 9-11 Commission report. It's public information. You, you recall after the uh, embassy attacks in 1998 in Kenya and Tanzania, there was a debate about what to do, what response the United States should, um, should give now that we had seen just how serious the al-Qaeda threat was. This, we had had worries about bin Laden for a while at this point, as you know. We had seen um, broader jihadist elements try to take down the World Trade Center in 1993. We had seen the plot to try to bring down a dozen airliners in the Pacific that was stopped um, in a Philippine apartment uh, in the mid-1990s. We had um, Iranian Hezbollah probably involved in the Kobar Towers bombing in the mid-90s as well. Uh, but Al-Qaeda was the most prominent anti-American organization. The broader Sunni uh, jihadist movement was the one of greatest concern. And in 1998, there was no longer any ambiguity after the August embassy bombings. Synchronized in two separate cities, two separate countries, more or less the same moment. So in the end, as you know, the, the, the uh, Clinton administration attacked those training camps in Afghanistan with cruise missiles. And it also attacked one chemical plant in Sudan, um, the cruise missile. Uh, in the 9-11 Commission report, and by the way, as you know, there's a, a delay of several hours in the flight time uh, because of that, not to mention the need to develop the intelligence. So you've got probably an 8, 10, 12 hour delay between your latest fresh intelligence and when you can act on it if you're going to take this sort of a route. And as we all know, we have been hoping that bin Laden might be there when we attacked, but he wasn't and he survived. Um, I'm not saying there was any easy answer in 98, but I do believe, and my reading of the 9-11 Commission report reconfirms this impression, that General Shelton, very honorable man who was then chairman of the Joint Chiefs and a former, former special operations commander, didn't want to put his special operations forces on the ground in Afghanistan to go after bin Laden directly. He thought it was too risky. He didn't know how he could get them out. He, he thought in very traditional terms about, in understandable terms, especially for a casualty averse nation, about how do I make sure I don't lose even one guy? Meanwhile, of course, we knew what plot, we now know what plot was being hatched out of some of those same camps and what it did to our country uh, three years later. But Shelton's opinion basically carried the day with very little debate. And I think, in part, it was because the Clinton administration didn't have even one ounce of Rumsfeld in them. And one ounce would have been good, even if you didn't want 175 pounds worth. One ounce would have been good to say, General Shelton, let's think this one through, you know? Let's think through the, what we know and what we don't know and the things we don't know that we don't know and so on and so forth. And, and by the way, there was a general schoolmaker, now Army Chief of Staff, who at that time was the head of Army Special, or of, of overall Special Operations Command, who, according to the 9-11 Commission report, thought we had several other options, using AC-130 gunships, perhaps even forces on the ground. But it would have taken a lot of confidence, and I'm not sure the confidence was fully there on the part of the Clinton administration to really encourage this debate and hear them out. Now, maybe they would have come to the same conclusion. 
And there certainly was an understandable reason they came to that conclusion. But it's an indication of where civil-mil relations, civil-military relations, were not quite right then either. And we know what's happened since. Rumsfeld discarded General Zinni's uh, fairly complete Iraq war plan. He insists that every single unit that was going to ship out be justified one by one. The military was distracted with this whole argument about how do we keep this and that unit here. They were all fighting over the time-phased force deployment, the TIPFID, rather than preparing for phase four in the post-Saddam period. And I think it will be the tragedy of Rumsfeld's tenure that his philosophy of challenging the military on many of its assumptions really became a tragic uh, result, created a tragic result in regard to the Iraq war plan. And we had a very poor preparation for what to do after Saddam fell. But interestingly, in many other issues, when Rumsfeld took the same approach, either he knew where to stop, or he got luckier, or he maybe the military pushed back more effectively, and you got a good dynamic where Rumsfeld challenged assumptions, and the military then had to justify assumptions that, as those of you know who have been in the military, sometimes get entrenched and just they're no longer really questioned. And this is true in our war plans. This is true in our force planning. You know, the Air Force always wants fighter jets. The Army always wants the bigger artillery. Uh, the war plans always involve a traditional uh, air ground component, you know, sledgehammer through the enemy's um, ground forces. Uh, and Rumsfeld, I think, shook those things up a bit. And there's a certain benefit to that approach. The Democrats would be well advised to try to emulate the next time they're in a position uh, of running the Pentagon themselves, and even thinking through their role in, in encouraging military reform and transformation. And the message here is challenge assumptions a lot. Be awfully nervous, though, when you assume your own instincts are correct for replacing the established wisdom. But challenge the wisdom and challenge the assumptions a lot. Now, that's not a real concrete policy recommendation. Uh, so I gave you a couple of more concrete things in regard to Homeland Security on these police counterintelligence units and so forth, counterterrorism units. This one's a more general point. Uh, and we wind up with a few specific recommendations on weaponry and on, on, on defense capabilities. I'll just give you um, one, which is in regard actually to Homeland Security, where we suggest the National Guard needs a little more capability to handle Katrina-like disasters. And we should have one or two brigades of capability that are focused on domestic response on a major scale, not so much so they can do it all, but they can become then the nucleus mm -hmm. of a broader operation and practice interfacing with local responders who in the end generally should be the bulk of our response effort. So we have a lot of recommendations like that inside the Defense Department. You know, they really amount to one and two and three billion dollar increments of money. We're not saying throw away manned aircraft and throw away the tank. Uh, and we think, again, Democrats or anybody should be a little bit wary about coming up with that kind of a radical new view. Uh, because there are a lot of reasons why we have the forces we do today. And overall, they're a pretty good balance for the set of contingencies that Kurt and I go through in the book. Uh, so we don't, again, we're trying to strike a balance between being reformist and, uh, and also being conservative in some sense, that you don't want to discard good thinking and good ideas from the past the way that, unfortunately, Rumsfeld did when he threw away General Zinni's old Iraq war plan and forced everybody to start from scratch. So that's just an aside on Rumsfeld. Um, now let me get to Iraq, which is where I really want to focus uh, about 10 more minutes and uh, hopefully tee up a conversation on that subject with you. Uh, I'll begin with what I've seen in, in today's newspapers, because in today's newspapers we've learned that the Democrats are going to push harder than initially expected for uh, a concrete reduction in forces in Iraq this year. I, was, um, I had the pleasure of doing Shepard Smith's show on Fox TV on election night at 12 o'clock, and we were trying to figure out what a Democratic majority in the Congress could mean for the House of Representatives, and we were all referring back to statements that Pelosi had made that she wasn't going to try to play the ultimate weapon of the budget weapon. She wasn't going to try to cut off funding for Iraq. And that was our expectation of where things stood. Now it sounds a little different already, six days later. She hasn't said, I'm going to cut off funding. But she has said, they have said, she and, and the Democratic leadership more generally, we're interested in mandating a troop reduction this upcoming year. Uh, I got to tell you, I don't think that's the right way for Democrats to talk. And let me say this with all due respect to those who have already concluded that we've lost in Iraq. Uh, you may have family members or friends who have lost their lives or been hurt there. You may uh, have concluded from your own knowledge of counterinsurgency or from the Arab world, and we have a lot of people here who have dealt with the Arab world or with Vietnam or other such incidents in your careers. You may have concluded we've already lost. Anybody who thinks we've already lost, I think you have every right, if not the obligation, to advocate that we get out fast, if not immediately, if that's what you really think. 
But I'm not sure most Democrats are really there. I think most Democrats recognize that we're losing. They recognize that maybe this war was a mistake to get into in the first place, but we can't, un we can't undo the war. They recognize George Bush has not done a good job of executing it. And in fact, we have chapter two of our book is called Iraq and the Myth of Republican Superiority, because we think that Iraq debunks the argument that some Republicans used to like to make, that they're just naturally better at foreign policy than Democrats. They sort of created a priesthood, and they pass it along from the Reagan administration to the first Bush administration to the second Bush administration, a lot of the same people. Actually, I'm delighted to see Jim Baker and Bob Gates back in this debate. Um, but they haven't been, unfortunately, for most of the last few years. And that's sort of a, a myth that we think has been debunked to a large extent by Iraq because the execution of this war uh, was, was so poor, not because the idea for it was bad or good. Um, but anyway, with all due respect to those who think we've already reached the end in Iraq, and the only question is how many more American casualties do we take before the inevitable happens? I understand where you're coming from, but I don't think that's where most people are, and that's not where I am. I think right now we're losing, but we have one last chance. And I think the democratic foreign policy and national security thinking should proceed from that basic presumption. Because if not, as a bare minimum, we Democrats will be vulnerable to the Republican critique that we're putting getting the troops home ahead of protecting the country's strategic interests. Now, obviously, this, this critique is made in a callous way, in a self-serving way by many Republicans. Uh, the defeatocrat words made me visibly angry and physically upset during the fall. I thought they were insulting to uh, Democrats in a way that, frankly, most things George Bush had said in the previous six years never caused that kind of a reaction in me, but those words did. So I think it's nonsense to speak in that kind of language. But having said that, Democrats will make themselves vulnerable to it if they now make getting out as priority number one. I would propose a twist on that. Doesn't mean that we should stay forever. Doesn't mean we should do the Joe Lieberman thing. Joe, Joe Lieberman's a great American, but I don't think he's been right on Iraq either. I think he's been too willing to just support the president. We've got to find a different way to inject new ideas into this and give one last shot at it in 2007. And if it doesn't start to improve in 2007, then I would concede to you the case starts to look stronger and stronger that this war is lost. And the 2008 presidential race will be about getting out of Iraq. But I think we, we owe it to our strategic interests uh, and to our men and women in arms that if there's any chance still of winning, that we try. How do I propose doing that? Well, I think that we can try to start by making a virtue out of necessity. We have divided government in the United States starting in January. All the things I've just been talking about mean that President Bush cannot commit the United States to an indefinite presence in Iraq any longer. For a long time, it seemed like maybe he could. Karl Rove would figure out how to find that Democratic Achilles heel, whatever it was in the latest round. They'd go after it, they'd win the next election, and Bush could just stay the course. That was sort of the way it felt for a while until the last few weeks, and specifically until last Tuesday. Now we can go to the Iraqis and we can say, you know what? Shape up or we are shipping out. And if you don't believe, you know, that's a hard thing for George Bush to say, because if he says that and he means it, that means he's prepared to declare his own presidency a failure. The Iraq war is the centerpiece of his presidency. Yes, he's done other things, but that's the main big decision he made. And for him to get out and condemn that country to the likely civil war, or nearly inevitable civil war that would follow, means he'd be conceding that he himself is going to have a poor place in our nation's history. Very hard thing for him to have done on his own. Now he's got some help standing behind him, Ms. Pelosi, Senator Reid. And they're not going to put up with this. And at the moment, I think they may be slightly overestimating how much of a mandate they have with this immediate phased withdrawal. But if things keep going badly, they will have the country's mandate to get out of what's seen as a losing effort. So President Bush, I think, can tell Prime Minister al Maliki, you've got some big decisions to make, my friend. They're your decisions to make. You are the democratically elected leader of a sovereign country. And you cannot be told by us what to do, but we also may make our own decision to get out of your country at some point if you don't cooperate in being reasonable and responsible in a few things. You need to reach out to the Sunnis. If you don't, there will be a civil war. In fact, there already is a civil war. Avoiding that term, I think, is pointless now. It's a low-grade civil war. It could become an all-out civil war. I was in two, week, two weeks ago, I was at the Conference of European Armies in Heidelberg, speaking with a lot of American generals. I had the honor of speaking before that crowd, too, and I won't say who it was, but uh, one of the American generals said to me, he thought that if, if Iraq really went bad, it would be somewhere between Bosnia and Rwanda in terms of severity of violence, probably closer to Rwanda. 
in per capita terms. That's just his impression, but I'll tell you, it's one of the top uh, few people we've got on the ground in Iraq who had that impression. Um, so we've got to tell Prime Minister al-Maliki, you are getting ready uh, to have a bloodbath in this country. And what we've seen so far, however terrible it's been, could get several times worse. And therefore, you've got to do a couple of things. You've got to promise the Sunni Arabs their fair share of the oil forever. Now, there are all these convoluted rules in the Constitution, which, by the way, is supposed to have already been revised, but al-Maliki hasn't gotten around to it. It was supposed to be, once the government was formed in Iraq this spring, there was supposed to be an immediate clock that started ticking on a four-month period for constitutional review on issues like how do you share the oil, which is ambiguous in the current Constitution. You can read Articles 109 through 112. Parts of it seem to say it's Baghdad's to control for the whole country. Parts of the Constitution, Constitution seem to say the oil is primarily the provinces. Uh, to control. And so there's ambiguity. There has to be some resolution. And there's only one answer that gives us any chance of, of preserving some stability or restoring some stability to Iraq, and that's sharing the oil. Maliki's got to do it. Also, former Ba'athists. There are 1.5 million former Ba'athists in Iraq. Most of them are people like, I uh, hesitate to say it, but people like us, you know, people who, uh, who basically had professional jobs in Iraq, and if you wanted to have that job, you had to join the Ba'athist party. Now, it probably would have been the more honorable thing to do not to join and forego the job. But most of them don't have blood on their hands and never did. Most of them were not cronies of Saddam. Um, maybe they were Saddam's willing executioners, to borrow a phrase, but they were not directly complicit. And moreover, they have half the country's technical expertise, and they represent the Sunni leadership. If they are not allowed to get back into their lives and their jobs, first of all, half of them have already left the country. Secondly, the rest of them are going to keep Stoke in trouble. And they're going to be the ones who continue to radicalize the Sunni Arab street. So we have to get them with some kind of a stake in the new Iraq, and that means accelerating the process of rehabilitating lower-level Ba'athists, a truth and reconciliation process modeled on the South Africa plan or certain other countries' plans that have done the same sort of thing. Maliki's got to get that going. Obviously, he needs to rein in the militias. That's a harder one to measure. I don't know exactly how you rein in the militias. I don't think you can do it in a, you know, in a complete way. But he's obviously got to be willing to fire certain people. And our commanders on the ground, our intelligence on the ground, to a large extent, knows who some of these people are. So you can monitor that. You're never going to have a yes or no, is he getting rid of the militia leaders or not? But you can watch to see if he accelerates his efforts. Um, I think al-Maliki should also be willing, and maybe we could offer some help here, to create jobs in Iraq, to offer an employment creation program, FDR style, to get more Iraqi young men and women, but the young men are the bigger problem here, willing to do something more constructive with their time. I don't mean to suggest that if only they would work in low-paying jobs, they would stop shooting off RPGs and planting IEDs. I admit that some of them would keep doing that by night, even if they took a job by day. But you got to deal with 50 percent unemployment in the Sunni Arab region. How can that be consistent with defeating an insurgency? An insurgency is largely about economics and politics. So you've got to handle the politics and the economics pieces of this as well. Those are the kind of things we got to demand from al-Maliki. Um, I just mentioned the jobs program. I think we can do this. We can offer some help. I once spoke to a Bush administration high-ranking official about this last spring, and I said, why wouldn't you want to do this? Our own commanders on the ground did this after they arrived. Uh, General Odierno, General Petraeus, they created jobs in their sectors in the first months after the invasion using discretionary money at their own fingertips or what they found, the money they found they were allowed to spend in, in, in this sense, and they will firmly defend these kinds of commanders will firmly defend the effectiveness of job creation, for getting buy-in from more of the community about the idea of building a new country. But we're not doing it now. Last fall, President Bush admitted we'd focus too much of our economic reconstruction effort on large-scale infrastructure. I understand why we try to do it, but it should never be the only thing we're doing. So a large job creation program, I think, is also a good idea. The issue that John McCain raised in the last couple of days about whether we should increase troops or not, short answer is we really can't unless we're going to take an even greater risk with the health of our Army and Marine Corps. Unless you can figure out in advance you're going to do it temporarily. So if Senator McCain can link that proposal to an argument about why we can draw down next year and why we should draw down regardless of whether it works or not, then I think he has a chance with that proposal. Otherwise, I think it won't fly because we've already worked our men and women so hard in the Army and Marine Corps. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on security issues. Uh, I think that's going to be a very hard nut to crack, and my recommendations are more on the politics and economic side. 
I'm going to leave you with one last proposal uh, that is not one that I would, I'll be very quick because I'm already uh, up to where we should be in the Q&A, but um, Joe Biden and Leslie Gelb have talked about a soft partitioning of Iraq for a long time, and I always opposed it. Because the question is, what do you do about Baghdad? Gelb and Biden said, well, turn it into a trusteeship. Well, great. I mean, uh, 7 million people all of a sudden you're now trustee of. You know, that's a pretty big population to just sort of put off to the side because you can't quite figure out how they fit into your overall proposal. That was always my reaction. And they, at least they said, share the oil revenue equally on a per capita basis. So that part I thought they had right. But I'm starting to think that even though Iraqis really do prefer a multi-ethnic integrated Iraq, and they don't really emotionally prefer the biden gelb plan, we're not going to have much choice pretty soon. And the, if the things keep going the way they are with the militia violence, we're going to have two ways to get to soft partition. One through Bosnia-Rwanda-style genocide and ethnic killing, the other through negotiated uh, outcome and a negotiated process where people can relocate voluntarily if they want and you help them with new jobs and new houses as they move. I don't want to do that now because I think it's such a radical idea and it has a, a, a risk to it that you're going to encourage the very militia violence you're trying to respond to. But if you get to a point where you feel like you're really on the cusp of an all-out genocide, you may not have much choice. Now the Iraqis would have to come to this conclusion themselves. I'm not suggesting we could impose it on them. But a soft partitioning where you share oil and essentially allow the Sunnis to move west of the Tigris River in Baghdad and elsewhere, Shia east, Kurds up north, and then each side essentially polices its own people. This may be pretty soon the only hope we have left short of all-out withdrawal and civil war and defeat. And that's the sort of debate whether you like my ideas or not. I hope as a, a hard power, Democrat, Independent, or Republican, or whatever your stripes, that you will uh, be willing to get into this debate about Iraq because I, I will finish with this one line which is again to reiterate unless you've already concluded that we've lost I think we all have to be working hard to give 2007 one last chance and make this the final big push uh, to try to salvage something not a not a pristine victory but something out of what could otherwise be a huge debacle for America actually I think worse than Vietnam and quite serious for our long-term security if it fails thank you for your attention I look forward to your comments Michael, thank you very much. Uh, I have to repeat the questions, as you know, for the cameras, Mr. Shore. Well, uh, two questions. The, the, uh, uh, the second being the most explosive, uh, <laughs> which is, of course, would the Bush administration uh, actually accept defeat in Iraq if they could be guaranteed uh, maintaining their tax uh, structure? And the, the earlier question was, uh, uh, more troops has always been an interesting option. Uh, isn't it a third rail? Uh, and if it's so important, why is it not part of the debate of the moment? Uh, I'll start with the second one, because I think I can be quicker, at least in my own opinion, on that, which is that I think it's a little bit, uh, it's, a, it's a nice theoretical question. I don't know that it's a meaningful real world question. I think, I will say this about George, but I think he's very committed to Iraq. I don't think he's done a good job, but I think he's serious about trying to do a good job. And I don't think he would put it second to anything. So I think he'd rather run up a big deficit, which I don't consider a virtue. Uh, but I think that's what he would do instead of choosing in the, in the hypothetical that you've laid out. In terms of the size of the army and the draft, uh, why we haven't had that debate? Well, it's a good question. I think in, the, in 2003, 2004, there was still a chance to make the army bigger the old-fashioned way, or maybe I should say the new-fashioned way, through uh, incentives. Uh, for an all-volunteer force. We could have expanded our recruiting goals. You all know in the 1980s we had a military of 2.1 million and we had an active duty army of 800,000. And uh, I'm writing a paper now with a friend Fred Kagan at the American Enterprise Institute and he wants to go back to something almost that big. I don't want to go back to something that big, but we agree on the need to go up. And there's been a lot of agreement on the need to go up. Unfortunately, in, in the last two years it's become almost implausible that you could do it through the all-volunteer system because, frankly, people are not that anxious to join. Uh, now, I'm, I'm actually struck by the fact that, it's, that they're still more or less coming close to their recruiting goals, and I'm especially struck by the patriotism of those who are already in. Retention rates have been outstanding. People are incredibly committed to this mission from inside in a way that, frankly, not only impresses me, but to, to some slight degree even confuses me. But I give them credit. Uh, it's a remarkable uh, bravery and commitment. So uh, anyway, the, the draft wasn't really the way we thought about it because in the first two years, we had the option of making the Army bigger through an all-volunteer mechanism. And General Schoomaker and Rumsfeld didn't think the operation was going to stay big enough, long enough. 
And so they, uh, they, they chose, they did have a choice. They worried that it was a choice between having a bigger army and buying the Army's modernization plan, the future combat system and so forth. And they wanted to do the latter. And so they made an explicit choice not to grow the Army and Marine Corps. Now, in terms of looking to the future, maybe you're right that we need to have that debate now. But even if you started a draft January 1st, which we all know we're not going to, but even if you did, it would take you at least, uh, at least uh, a year and a half to two years to have any meaningful impact on the available troops for Iraq. And so at, the longer this goes on, ironically, the harder it is to have that debate because it seems like it should be closer to the finish line. Uh, and so people are more discouraged from even entering into that conversation. Uh, how serious has been damage to our allies, our relations with our allies, and how long do you think that will last? It's a great question. Um, I know we have some retired diplomats and active diplomats in the room, so uh, you'll all have your opinions too. But I think Admiral Crow was partly right, but I, would, I wouldn't put it quite that way. I don't think the greatest harm is, for example, to NATO. NATO's not in all the greatest of shape, obviously. But no one's, you know, NATO allies, they're democracies. They know that George Bush only has two years to go. They don't like the guy, but they'll wait him out. They waited out Rumsfeld, and patience was a virtue. And there are a lot of happy people in Europe today because Mr. Rumsfeld's stepping down. Um, and I think that, frankly, NATO has 60 years of a strong foundation that, again, some of you helped establish, and it will survive. Uh, I have much more worry about our relations with non-allies or with friends who are sometimes security partners but not really formal allies, Pakistan, uh, Saudi Arabia, Egypt. I think these are the places where the way in which we've been seen, even though it's been an unfair characterization of our motives and our effort, it's dramatically hurt us, and we have popularity numbers in the 10 and 20 percent. In Turkey, our popularity is 12 percent right now. Unbelievably bad in Turkey. And, uh, and so that is what worries me, because that leads to the creation of second generation Al Qaeda. And that's, to me, the greater worry. Would you comment on the Arab Israeli uh, conflict, uh, its place in our foreign policy, and uh, what you think should be done about it? We do talk about it in the book. And we, in the same place, we talk about the problem that you mentioned, ma'am, the problem of our, basically our image in the Islamic world and our broader role in the world. And we, th this chapter is called The Long War. It's, you know, how do you deal with the next generation problem, essentially? And that's where we put the Arab-Israeli uh, situation in context. Uh, if you had six people from The Sun talking about this, you probably had 60 times the amount of expertise that you've got with me. So I'm just going to be very brief. Uh, I have huge admiration for Israel but I think they should give back the West Bank. And I think we are in an untenable position to essentially be seen as their ally when they are occupying the West Bank. I understand that there are a million reasons why the Palestinians have made it hard for them. Bill Clinton tried to do a deal. It was a pretty good deal. The Palestinians should have taken it, and they would have their own country now. And so I am not faulting Israel for everything in this by any means. But I think a, an American position has to be willing to put a little more pressure on them. And on this, uh, as our book does on a few issues, we actually uh, also sing the praise of George Bush 41, who I think was willing to restrict, as you recall, loan guarantees to the Israelis that might have been used for expanding West Bank settlements. So to me, that's the lever you use with the Israelis, who are otherwise a magnificent ally that we should be proud to count among our friends. But I think we have to be willing to show a little tough love, because now their problems are our problems, too, in a much more direct way than they ever were before. Uh, first question, if there was a partition, who would guard the borders? And uh, the second almost seems like ancient history now. Should we have focused on Afghanistan rather than Iraq? On the second one, let me, great question. So let me, let me say that uh, we don't try to take a strong position on whether the Iraq war was right or wrong. Your argument, the way you put it, very pithily, very compelling case. And it's pretty hard to disagree with you, especially now, especially given what we've seen. And, um, and you probably held the position all along, so I commend you for uh, your foresight. Uh, but, but, but I did, no, I'm serious, but, 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 uh, but, but I was a person who was a qualified supporter of the Iraq invasion, and I suppose I may have to think about whether that was the correct p position to be in or not. Um, but I think that the point is, at, at this moment in time, um, Afghanistan's not going well. Uh, Iraq's going even worse. The question is, um, would Afghanistan be going really well if we had more forces there? I think the answer probably is yes. So I think to answer your question, you have to construct a world in which you have Saddam still in power, with all that implies. And that's not all good stuff. But Saddam's still in power, and Afghanistan at least somewhat better versus the world we have today. I'll leave it at that. But in the book, we do not try to take a strong position on the Iraq war, because it's too easy to make the issue, uh, let me f just finish this point, it's too easy to make the issue of whether or not we should have fought the war what the whole book's about. And, and then you're going you're gonna to anger half your readers 
based on which answer you give. That's not a reason to avoid tough questions, but given where we are today, looking forward, we are in Iraq. And so I do not think we can meaningfully do what you're suggesting, or at least that we, what we might have done five years ago. Um, who's going to patrol the DMZ? DMZs are easier to patrol than city streets. If I'm using the Tigris River as my dividing line, I agree with you, or the implication of your question, it's still a hard job. I would trade anything to have that problem over the one we got now. Would you comment on the Hopkins study? You imply, uh, sir, with due respect, that this study was done in a very professional way with the only goal being to inform the broader debate. Then why did it come out on October 11th, three weeks before an election? Uh, the more important point, and you're, you're, I, didn't, I didn't nod my head or shake or utter sounds when you were asking, so please let me go ahead. Uh, this study was done in the face of countless on-the-record on-site investigations by people in Iraq who were on the scene doing mortality evaluations after every major airdrop after, of an of American weapon, after a lot of the street battles. There were thousands of people who risked their lives to report back on what was going on in Iraq. I have consulted morgue data from Iraq, hospital data from Iraq. Every single estimate is a factor of 10 or more, or roughly 10 less than this study. This study was a sampling approach, as you know and understand better than I, and I grant you that. Uh, but the point being, we had a lot of people on the ground in Iraq looking at a lot of these individual episodes, and their numbers were systematically a factor of 10 less. Now, I can't go back without doing a study myself and figure out what caused the Hopkins study to be 10 times higher. And you have your opinions, I have mine. I have no doubt that the official tallies undercount fatalities in Iraq, but do they undercount them by a factor of 10? That strikes me as putting uh, an epidemiological study surveying a few hundred families for their opinions, which may or may not be colored by politics, way ahead of data that was accumulated on the ground by people who were doing the job in a painstaking way. And moreover, the Hopkins study said, well, 94, 95 percent of these deaths are backed up by death certificates. Well, if that's true, where are all these death certificates? Where are the records of them? The implication being there should be 650,000 additional death certificates in Iraq compared to what you, you would have had. No Iraqi official has said that. No Iraqi official of any political persuasion has ever said that the numbers are above 100,000 to 150,000. So I think that the Hopkins study, I'm willing to read it, but the implication that somehow because it's wrapped in scientific exactitude that we should give this more credibility than the work of people on the ground, I don't accept. The, uh, the uh, unfortunately, uh, that has to be the last question. We, uh, we try to end our sessions promptly at 7.10. We're fairly close to that. Uh, I think this has been a marvelously informative evening. Uh, we thank uh, Dr. O'Hanlon enormously.